Where's the freaking button? Sorry, that's uh, I left my amplifier on, and I think the phone was making weird noises. Um. E G Q plus. So right now, obviously, a lot of us are spending more time at home, whether that means just working from home or like in my case, still going into work, but then just coming straight home, uh, not going to the store, not going out drinking, not going out, hanging out with friends. Uh, And whether that's something you normally do or not, uh, psychologically, I think the fact that we sort of have to just stay home has sort of an impact uh, on uh, on a lot of us, myself included. And so one of the things that I wanted to try to do was to put out more content in the next few weeks, just to, you know, in some small way, uh, do my part to make things easier for other people. And quite frankly, also to make things easier for myself, uh, because this gives me something to do and something to focus on. So you know, obviously I could just make more flashback episodes and I understand that a lot of people want like more flashback episodes, but one thing you have to remember is that there's sort of a finite amount of content for flashback episodes, right? At some point, um, we're going to be caught up to the present day and then I don't, I don't know what I'm going to talk about, uh, anymore. So, uh, you know, obviously the four flashbacks we did last year was not enough. But at the same time, I'm trying to be careful not to rush through it too quickly uh, because I don't want to get to the end either. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I wanted to try to think of what else could I do besides the obvious being live streaming. And, you know, when I first started doing the magazine read throughs, they were sort of of lower production quality, right? Like I wasn't really editing them. I wasn't using a two camera setup. I wasn't putting in video game footage. And, you know, doing something like that now, I think would be sort of out of place on the main channel. But uh, I think there's no reason why we can't do something like that over here on, on the plus. So what I decided to do was to grab a magazine uh, off the shelf that, you know, I, I bought this magazine back in the day and I can just speak a lot more off the cuff about what's in the magazine without doing research first and maybe I'll have more stories to tell. So in some ways, it's kind of like a flashback episode uh, and a magazine read through mixed together. I might try to stick some gameplay footage in here after the fact if it's stuff I already have, but sort of the idea with this is to just record it and do minimal editing and, uh, and put it out there, which is sort of the point of the side channel in the first place. So uh, as I'm sure you saw in the video title, the magazine we're going to check out today is PSM issue number two. Now, probably a few years ago now on the show, I did a read through of PSM issue number one, which uh, I also bought. So I bought both of these magazines uh, off the newsstand. Uh, this was, uh, from September of 1997. So it was probably on the newsstands in say August. So, uh, not long after I bought final fantasy seven. And the whole reason I bought this magazine was because this, this 10 page, uh, final fantasy seven guide is sort of the cover story. And, uh, final fantasy seven was really my first time really trying in earnest to like get into a final fantasy game. And I just didn't know what I was doing. So when I saw this on the on the magazine rack at my local grocery store, I grabbed it. But uh, this magazine only covers disc one uh, of Final Fantasy VII. So I was keeping my eyes peeled for issue number two to come out because that covers discs two and three. So I also bought this issue off the newsstands. And uh, for anybody that's watched, uh, watched my other PSM read-throughs, you'll know I pulled the subscription card out of this magazine and sent it in and started my subscription, but that didn't start until issue number four. So uh, so anyway, yeah, we're just gonna give uh, this issue a flick through now. So you see the main cover story here is Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which I would say is probably the other big release from 1997. Uh, this is the October 97 issue, so I think that's why there's sort of the, the Halloween theme. They've got the orange here. Uh, game's so good, they're scary. And uh, it, they say it comes with a Resident Evil lid sticker. The lid sticker is not in here. And generally, I would keep that stuff in here. So I don't know if I took this off and gave it to somebody because I certainly didn't put a lid sticker on, uh, on my PlayStation. 
So inside cover here, we have an ad for Hercules. Now, I was 20 years old when I had this magazine, so uh, something like this was going to be of absolutely no interest to me whatsoever. So I'm sure I just skip past it, which is what we will do now. And the second ad here is an ad for Final Fantasy VII. Uh, someone please get the guys who make cartridge games a cigarette and a blindfold. And uh, that's really quite true. And I think that's maybe to a certain extent taking a swipe at Nintendo because at one point, uh, this game may be sort of not in anything even approaching its final form, but at one point, the seventh installment in the Final Fantasy series was supposed to come out on the, the Nintendo 64. So uh, that seems like that's maybe taking a little bit of a swipe at those guys. Uh, here we get to the masthead and uh, the letter from the editor. And I thought this was a pretty cool uh, letter from the editor. The, the editor-in-chief uh, of PSM was, of course, Chris Slate, who went on to become the editor-in-chief of Nintendo Power uh, later on. And uh, it's a pretty cool letter. Here he's talking about, uh, you know, hypothetically asking where are the original games? Well, they're right here on the PlayStation. And he's primarily talking about Parappa the Rapper, which had just come out stateside, although I think they had been playing the Japanese uh, import version as well. And he also mentions uh, games like Monster Rancher and Carnage Heart, Aquanauts Holiday. Uh, just making the point that, you know, not every game on the PlayStation was, you know, a, a shooter or a sports game. Uh, and that's really true. And another thing that they, they used to do, uh, I don't know how long this lasted in PSM, is they would sort of show the cover art taking shape by, uh, you know, showing like here's probably a rough draft and then, you know, maybe some slight modifications to that first rough draft, and then here's the, the final form. And I, I always thought that was pretty cool. Um, we already talked about the PSM team in a, a previous Let's Read, so I'm not going to get into it too much. Although I will say uh, Stephen Frost is pretty cool. He's pretty active on Twitter. Uh, I don't follow that many people on Twitter, but I do follow uh, Stephen Frost because he, he tweets a lot, and they're always, they're always interesting. Uh, another ad, this time for Tomb Raider 2, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, I feel like Lara Croft was kind of like the first female video game hero that people got maybe a little bit obsessive about, and I think that the developers really uh, keyed in on that. And, uh, you know, because the whole point of this ad here, it's 4 a.m. in Tallahassee, Florida. Two drunks battle it out in the hall. The 38 Express squeals to a halt every half hour on the street below. Sleep doesn't come easy in room 23, but for 19-year-old Ray Cooper, it has nothing to do with the noise. As he says, it's because she's all I ever see every time I close my eyes. So sort of the, the idea of the, you know, gamer dude being uh, obsessed with Lara Croft uh, personally, I never got into Tomb Raider back in the day. Um, someone lent me a copy of Tomb Raider 1, and uh, I played it a little bit, and like it seemed fine, but uh, I don't know what it was. It was just not a game I was ever really interested in picking up, so like I never had Tomb Raider 2 or Tomb Raider 3. Now we get into the table of contents. Um, we don't ever really go through these, but uh, just once again, the cover story is Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Uh, they have this... Uh, feature on accessorizing your PlayStation. Now, we already read through PSM issue number three, so you may remember that there was a part two to this article that we did talk about when we did that read-through, and so now we're going to see part one. Uh, of course, there's the uh, second part of the Final Fantasy VII walkthrough, and uh, I thought this was kind of cool. I mean, it's just going to be on the next page, but um, they talk about the dual analog controller, which uh, I don't know if it's specifically because I read about it in this magazine, but I did go out and buy this right when it came out. And uh, we'll check about check up on that right now. Uh, so here we go. Sony unleashes the dual analog pad. Uh, again, I bought that right when it came out. I still have my original analog pad. I think I found a second one at a thrift store. For a while, these were like uh, a little bit sought after among collectors, like not like they're super rare, but, you know, they were replaced fairly quickly by the DualShock. Uh, the difference here being that the dual analog pad uh, does not have force feedback, which they, they talk about here. I don't know if you can read that. It says a fatal flaw. And the fatal flaw they're talking about is the fact that uh, in the U.S., 
or in North America, rather, uh, there is no force feedback due to some kind of uh, uh, patent dispute that uh, Sony was in. They make it seem in here like Sony was forced to remove it due to the fact that it infringed on a technology patent. My understanding is that Sony just didn't want to pay a licensing fee. So I don't think they were being forced to do anything. But uh, the other cool thing about this pad is that it's a little bit bigger than the DualShock. And so for a guy like me who has sort of larger hands, uh, I find this to be more comfortable in my hand. The, uh, the sticks are also uh, concave on the top, so your thumbs kind of fit into them nicely, which that feels cool. The only downside is that the sticks on this controller uh, do not have the, the rubber coating, which is sort of a double-edged sword because I feel like, you know, obviously these are not going to be as grippy, but I think as time goes on, you know, I'll take one of my uh, Dual Shocks or Dual Shock 2s out, and sometimes that rubber starts to feel kind of gummy because it's getting old, and that, of course, will not be a problem uh, with this controller. And then down here, uh, so I didn't know this, uh, somebody in like a live stream or something was telling me I needed to pick up Porsche Challenge for the PSX, and I finally did. I've only played it once because I didn't really have too much time, but it is a cool game. But uh, what I didn't realize here is uh, this is the first racing game, it says, to use both of the pad's analog joysticks. The left joystick is used for left and right analog steering, as you would expect, much like in Rallycross, the right joystick is used for both both gas and braking. So that might be interesting to check out. I didn't know that. Um, I think I actually still have this game sitting next to my PlayStation upstairs. So I should pop that back in and check out that control scheme. And then uh, over here, they're talking about, uh, as I mentioned, Parappa the Rapper finally came out in the U.S. And it's funny because... Uh, the guys that worked at this magazine were obviously really big into Parappa the Rapper. And for some reason, I never picked it up back in the day. Um, obviously, the game looks kind of cartoony. I mean, it looks very cartoony. So I don't know if that was like a turnoff for me or something. Um, I did get it, but years and years and years later. And, uh, you know, certainly it's a really cool game. So I'm just, I don't understand why you would think with all the hype they were giving it, I would have picked it up. Uh, but I just didn't. And then over here, they've got like their little notes, which are just uh, really quick little news blurbs. So I'm just checking to see if there's anything in here uh, that's interesting. Current PlayStation sales have reached 17.6 million worldwide, which is certainly good news for Sony. If trends continue, then a user base of over 22 million units could be possible by the end of the year. So obviously that's very strong sales. Uh, then they go on... Here in this other one, due to the strong PlayStation sales, Sony's 1997 first quarter profits have more than doubled from last year's figures. Predictions have the company's year-end profits at $1.42 billion. Uh, that's a lot. Um, talk down here about uh, gun game fans may have to be a little bit more patient as Namco's time crisis has been delayed another month. So that's kind of a bummer. Yeah. All right. What else we got over here? Uh, Square in charge. Will Final Fantasy VII pave the way for more U.S. RPGs? And what they go on to talk about in here is just the fact that there really was a dearth of RPGs uh, on the PlayStation for the first couple of years, which is crazy because if you look back at the PlayStation library now, there were a lot of RPGs, but they didn't come out until later. And uh, this article is sort of making the argument that perhaps Final Fantasy VII was what sort of blazed the trail for uh, other such games uh, to come out. Um, yeah, they don't. Well, they mention Alundra, uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, Saga Frontier. Um, if this trend continues, RPGs might once again get their due, all thanks to a little company by the name of Square. And then down here, they're talking about other games that Square was going to be coming out with that uh, were not Final Fantasy VII. Uh, the first one here is Einhander, which was a uh, horizontally scrolling shooter. I actually have that game. I don't really have anything to say about the rest of these games. I've never played any of the front mission games, and I haven't played uh, Parasite Eve. It says here, Parasite Eve is, is an RPG based on a popular Japanese science fiction novel that happens to be set in Manhattan. So... And the game's graphical engine is similar to the one used in Final Fantasy VII. So, I mean, that definitely might be cool to check out. I just don't know anything about it. And I'm, I don't have it, but I'm sure I could pick it up. Or I'm waiting still for my PlayStation to come back 
from uh, getting modded for the PSIO. So then I guess I don't have to worry about uh, picking up games on eBay anymore. Here's an ad for Pandemonium 2. Uh, you know, I used to see these ads a lot. Like these ads are kind of burned into my brain. You know, obviously, they got this this chick with the tight pants on and this kind of crazy nightmare inducing guy. I honestly don't know anything about Pandemonium. You know, I, I'm so familiar with their ads, but uh, I've never played uh, the game and don't know anything about it. Uh, except that it was put out by Crystal Dynamics uh, of Gex fame, so much so that Gex was part of their logo at this time. And then PSM used to have these Net Eurozy updates uh, in here. I always thought, you know, I would look at that and be like, wow, the Net Eurozy looks pretty interesting. It would be cool to like make a game for the PlayStation. But uh, I did not know then, as I do not know now, the first thing about programming. Uh, so obviously I didn't pick one up, and also the fact that I think the Net Eurozy was something like seven hundred dollars uh, would have uh, would have stopped me. Like yeah, here they're talking about this is a uh, Code Warrior for the PlayStation. This was a product that you could buy to help you code a PlayStation game, and that by itself was two ninety nine, and you had to already have a Net Eurozy to use that. Uh, anybody who doesn't subscribe to Modern Vintage Gamer, he recently did uh, a video about the Net Eurozy. So if you're interested in it. Uh, I would go check that out because I'm sure that's probably the definitive video uh, on YouTube for the Net Eurozy. Here's the gossip section. This is sort of like PSM's version of Quarterman. Uh, Final Fantasy toys coming. I don't know how that, that's not really gossip. That was just sort of a fact. I mean, they have a picture of one right there. Uh, Final Fantasy VIII to begin development. You have to think that by this time, uh, Final Fantasy VIII had probably already been in development for uh, quite some time. And then here they're talking about New Square Fighter coming to the PlayStation. And that, of course, was Erg Heights, if I'm saying that right. Um, I probably have played Erg Heights at some point. Um, not enough to really have my own opinion. All I can really say is that it's not well regarded by most gamers. So I will just uh, take their word for it. And then down here they have Rumor Smasher, which was something else they used to have in some of these early issues of PSM where we put false rumors to rest once and for all, Sony says no modem for you. So I don't know if I'm assuming that's supposed to be uh, a play on the soup Nazi. And uh, I don't even remember rumors about there being a Sony modem, but um, apparently those are false because it wasn't going to come out. And of course it never did. Over here is an ad for Red Asphalt. Uh, that's not a game that I know anything about, but to be quite honest, based on this ad alone, I kind of wouldn't mind checking it out. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Nihon Game Otaku section. So this was this guy, Bill Paris. Uh, this guy, uh, he was the Japanese correspondent. So, I mean, I don't know if he actually lived in Japan or how that worked, but uh, he would do this section. And so this was telling you what was going on uh, in the PlayStation world in Japan. And uh, I used to be pretty fascinated checking these things out. Because, uh, you know, first of all, a lot of these games would end up coming out here. And so this would give you sort of a, a, a first look at them. But, uh, you know, a lot of these games didn't come out here or you would just sort of see the differences in uh, the tastes of Japanese gamers. Like I would always check out this top 10 sellers in Japan. And you can see here the number one selling PlayStation game in Japan was Derby Stallion. So like I would look at that and be like, really Derby Stallion? Like what must that game be like that it's so popular in Japan? Like I didn't know. And I, I just remembered every month I would see Minano Golf would be on this list like every month. And uh, I didn't know anything about it, but I would just see like, ooh, golf game, that might be cool. And then finally uh, in some subsequent issue of PSM, they mentioned like, oh, Minano Golf is coming to America as uh, Hot Shots Golf, which I bought pretty much right after it came out. Uh, the other thing they got here, Spotlight on Tenchu. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head when Tenchu came out uh, here in the US, but it couldn't, it had to have come out before like the late spring of 98, because uh, I remember I bought this game right when it came out and uh, I liked it a lot. I didn't know that Tenchu means heaven's punishment. So that's kind of cool. And they describe it as essentially Metal Gear Solid set in 16th century feudal Japan. Uh, I don't have enough experience with Metal Gear Solid to um, to assess that statement, but uh, I really, really like Tenchu. It's probably an example of a game, you know, when people say that like PlayStation games don't age very well. Uh, that's probably a good example of that. Although for me, I can go back and play Tenchu 
and uh, I still think it's a lot of fun. Now we get into the review section. And, uh, you know, one thing I, I always found kind of frustrating about these reviews is they don't tell you who wrote them. And, I mean, I don't really know why that matters, but, like, these reviews are written in the first person. And so, to me, it just it's weird that they don't just put at the end, oh, this was Chris Slade or this was Stephen Frost. But it doesn't really matter. Um, so I'm not going to go through each one of these, but some of the games I had or, or for some reason didn't have. And so that's more interesting to talk about. Uh, the first one here, obviously, is uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which they give a perfect five out of five to, and rightfully so. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole review, but uh, I'll read some of it. Back in the early days of the NES, Castlevania was one of those classic games that helped define the action genre. Who could forget the long nights of whipping ghouls, collecting hearts, and blowing your top every time you lost to the Grim Reaper, which, yeah, I hated that guy. A string of sequels followed, and now Castlevania has finally come to the PlayStation. After spending nearly 50 hours knee-deep in blood and bones, all I can say is wow. And, um, yeah, uh, th this game definitely is mind-blowing. Uh, I talked about, uh, in one of the other PSM read-throughs, about how I didn't pick up Castlevania Symphony of the Night uh, early on, uh, partially because I had some kind of weird thing where uh, PSM named it their game of the year instead of Final Fantasy VII, and that, for whatever reason, because I was being a stupid fanboy, uh, it pissed me off. But uh, I didn't pick up Symphony of the Night until I think the year 2000, actually, when I, I got it used at, like, you know, Funko Land or something. And, you know, as soon as I started playing it, I realized how stupid I was for not buying it right off the bat. It, it's one of those must-have PlayStation games, uh, for sure. And then uh, over here is Bushido Blade. That's another game that I picked up uh, pretty much right when it came out. Uh, just based on the coverage in this magazine, uh, you know, I should just say, like, this magazine was really my only window into the world of PlayStation games. I didn't pick up uh, any of the other gaming magazines. Of course, GamePro and EGM were both still around, and there was also the official PlayStation magazine. And uh, I didn't buy any of those. I think the only gaming magazine that I have a strong memory of buying during this time that was not PSM is I bought one issue of PS Extreme. And uh, I only bought it, again, because it had a walkthrough for a game that I had. But uh, anyway, so I bought Bushido Blade uh, based on probably this review. And I'm sure there was probably a preview maybe in the previous issue. or uh, It must have had more coverage than just this. But uh, I bought it, and I thought it was pretty neat. I kind of liked the idea that it was a fighting game, but it didn't have, like, health bars. And uh, it also just had, like, cool atmosphere. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I still have it. I think I have it and Bushido Blade 2. Well, I wouldn't swear to that. These other two games, you have Clock Tower and Croc Legend of the Gabos. Uh, I've never played either of those, so uh, no opinion. Uh, here's Porsche Challenge, which, of course, we just talked about. They give it four stars. Uh, again, you know, I, I just got it and I haven't played it that much, so I don't really have a whole lot to say. Uh, you know, I mean, I like Porsches, so, uh, you know, the game seems cool. Next to that is Syndicate Wars, which, to be very honest, I didn't realize had been released on the PlayStation. Syndicate is one of my all-time favorite PC games. And uh, I don't, I've never tried playing any of the console-based uh, versions of Syndicate. I think it came out on the 3DO uh, and the Jaguar. And, uh, you know, obviously it came out on the PlayStation. I wasn't aware of that. They give it three and a half stars and they basically praise the game. But uh, as they say here, unfortunately, the overall feel is greatly hampered by the PlayStation controller. When a title is developed for the PC, it generally takes advantage of both the mouse and keyboard control. The translation to a console pad simply doesn't offer the intuitive control that lets you get quickly absorbed into the game's deep strategic elements. So that would be uh, my... Concerned with the game. Of course, there was a, a PlayStation mouse, which uh, completely coincidentally, I happen to have sitting uh, right on the desk next to me, uh, just because I'm going to need it for an upcoming episode of the show. And, uh, you know, obviously this could have been used with the game. I don't know if it's compatible or not. Uh, I'm actually kind of surprised at the number of games that would lend themselves so well to the mouse that uh, are not compatible with it. Anyway, uh, so that's Syndicate Wars. Next is Odd World Abe's Odyssey. That's not a game that I ever had, but uh, uh, my friend Rafe brought it over one time. I think he came over and spent the night at my house, maybe, or something. 
Uh, I know we were like, you know, 20 year olds or something, but, uh, you know, he lived pretty far away, uh, you know, like on the other end of town, like not in a different city, but it was, and I think he had to take the bus to get to my house and it just made more sense. Like just come over and you can crash on the couch and go home the next day. And uh, two of the games that I remember him bringing over were uh, Odd World, Abe's Odyssey, and Intelligent Cube. And it made me really like both of them. I, I did end up picking up Intelligent Cube. I didn't pick up uh, Odd World. Uh, I don't really know why not. PSM gives it four and a half stars, and uh, they don't really have anything bad to say about it. Here, of course, is Parappa the Rapper. Uh, as expected, they give it a perfect score, a 5 out of 5. Again, I just don't understand uh, why I didn't pick the game up. I guess, I mean, it is kind of like a, a almost DDR type of rhythm game, although you just use a controller. And for sure, that wasn't really going to be in my wheelhouse. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I had a job and didn't really have any living expenses. And so I'm just kind of surprised that I wouldn't just sort of take a risk on the game just to see if I liked it. And then down here... Warcraft 2, which I would kind of expect to have the same problems. Oh, yeah, they talk about it here. However, like many PC-to-console conversions, a simple joypad just can't offer the same diversity of control that the game was originally designed for. So I don't know for a fact that Syndicate Wars or Warcraft 2 are not compatible with the PlayStation mouse, but you would certainly think that if they were, uh, the reviewer would have brought it up. And then down here is NCAA Football 98, which... Uh, Again, I, I've never played it. Uh, you know, I had sort of a, a mild interest in NFL games, although I, I only ended up buying one, and I can't remember, or not even buying one, but I got it for Christmas. I can't remember if it's covered in this magazine or not, but as far as NCAA football went, like, I really had zero interest. Next here is Treasures of the Deep, and uh, I believe that at some point, I guess it would have been around this time, I had a demo disc it was a Namco demo disc. This is a Namco game. And I remember it having Treasures of the Deep on it. But I don't remember the game making any kind of impression on me that made me want to pick it up. Although they give it four, four and a half stars out of five. So um, ostensibly it's a good game. So maybe I should bust that demo disc out and, uh, and check it out again. Uh, Tecmo Stackers and Jurassic Park The Lost World both got two and a half stars. Never played either one of them. Ogre Battle I do actually have. They only give it three stars, which I'm a little bit surprised. Um, I haven't played this game. I Like I said, I have it, but I haven't actually played it. Uh, this game's not cheap if you want to get it now. I found a copy of it at a thrift store where I got the disc. And uh, it was the disc in the manual for like 50 cents. And then on uh, on eBay, I was able to buy the case. It was like the case with no manual, but it still had the cover art because I think... This game came in like a dual disc uh, uh, case, even though you only got one disc because the manual was too thick. So I, I, for like 20 bucks on eBay, I bought just the case with no manual or disc. So uh, I got a complete copy of Ogre Battle for like $20 and 50 cents. So I thought that was all right. It seems like uh, one of their main gripes with it is that it's basically a 16 bit game on a 32 bit console. And um, they see here, the graphics are a bit old looking. The music sounds like it's 16 bit but they say the concept is still cool but i'll play it mostly for nostalgia so uh that seems like that's sort of their big beef with it which is understandable because in 1997 you probably didn't want to feel like you were paying 50 dollars for uh for a 16-bit game never played grand tour racing uh, or fantastic four fantastic four gets one half of one star which is uh i don't think they've ever that I've seen, they ever gave literally zero stars to a game. So uh, that's about the worst review uh, I can recall ever seeing in PSM. So that must really be a bad game. Uh, then we get to the flashback section. So I think I mentioned this in one of my other PSM read-throughs, but back in the day when I was reading these, I didn't understand uh, how they could have flashback sections when, like this is only issue number two, right? And they're saying, okay, here is Project Horned Owl, which came out in 1996. Here was our original score, and here's our new score. Because I was just like, well, wait a minute. You weren't around in 1996. Like, how do you have an original score? Because they don't really explain it in here. But that was the score that the game got in Ultra Game Players, which uh, PSM sort of broke off from Ultra Game Players and became its own magazine. So that's all that is. 
And then that's why they have this backlog with scores for games that they didn't review in PSM. So at the time, I just thought it, it stuck out to me only because I'm like, are you just making stuff up? Uh, and that seems kind of weird, but no, they weren't making things up at all. So it makes more sense. Uh, MDK, I've talked about before the fact that I've never really played MDK. I think I played it a little bit on the Dreamcast because I burned a copy back in the day. But uh, aside from that, I haven't really played it. Uh, supposedly, it's a good game. So I'm not saying I haven't played it because it's not. Uh, I just haven't checked it out enough. So now we get into the preview section. Here's a preview for Metal Gear Solid. I've probably mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. I've, I really don't have any experience with Metal Gear Solid. Uh, I think what sort of turned me off to it back then was it was a little bit too cinematic for my taste. Like, I've never been a huge fan of games having, like, too many cutscenes or really long cutscenes. I kind of put up with them in Final Fantasy VII, but uh, that certainly was not my favorite part of the game. And uh, I think the other thing about it, though, is, uh, as I've mentioned before, I never really got into the original Metal Gear Solid, or the original Metal Gear, excuse me, which they show right here. I, I rented the game when I was a kid, but just didn't understand what I was supposed to do. And so I didn't have any, like, nostalgia for that game that made me want to check out Metal Gear Solid. I do have the game. I have both it and VR missions. And it's one of those games that I've always just intended, like, you know, at some point... Uh, I'm going to check out Metal Gear Solid, but uh, I don't know when that point uh, is going to be. I guess if I ever have to cover it on the show in earnest for some reason, that'll be why I finally play it. Nightmare Creatures, uh, I don't know anything about it. Uh, it kind of looks like a Resident Evil ripoff. You know, Res the first Resident Evil came out in uh, 95, so these people would have had more than enough time to come up with sort of a, uh, a knockoff game. I'm not saying that's what it is. I just don't know anything about the game. Uh, do they say anything? If you can picture a game that melds aspects of exploration, brutal fighting moves, and a setting straight out of Bram Stoker's horror novel, then you have a pretty good idea of what to expect from Nightmare Creatures. So if it's more like a 3D beat-em-up, like Fighting Force meets Resident Evil, then that would be pretty cool. Uh, I just don't know. And then uh, over here is Nuclear Strike, which would be... Uh, is that the fourth installment in the Strike series? Uh, no, this is the fifth installment. Uh, so you had uh, Desert Strike was the first one, then Jungle Strike, then um, Urban Strike. Those were all on 16-bit consoles. And then on the PlayStation, you had Soviet Strike. And then Nuclear Strike, which I think is the last installment in the series, I actually just picked up both Soviet Strike and Nuclear Strike complete in the in the jewel case, I guess, on eBay a couple of weeks ago. I was able to get both of them together in really nice shape for like $12, including shipping, which I was kind of surprised. Only because I had recently been playing uh, Jungle Strike on the Genesis, and it made me want to pick up some more of the games. Uh, that being said, I haven't had a chance to play this very much yet. I only played it a little bit. Uh, it just seems like if you like the Strike games, it, it's sort of more of the same this one has more cutscenes as like full motion video cutscenes, what they're showing here. It says it's unobtrusive. Uh, so I got like some glare. I'm having a hard time reading it. So here it says, uh, if used correctly, FMV isn't always a bad thing. Like Soviet Strike before it, Nuclear Strike makes excellent use of its unobtrusive FMV segments, furthering the plot artistically and stylishly. So, um, so yeah, there you go. Uh, again, like I said, I haven't played it enough to have too much of an opinion, but it seems to me like if you like the strike games, this is really just sort of more the same, but with better graphics and in a different setting. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, this is an ad for Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero, which uh, I don't know anything about. And I also don't know anything about this Ray Tracers game. For all I know, maybe it's a good game. But to be very honest with you, back then, like in the PlayStation and PlayStation 2 days, if I saw THQ, uh, I was generally, I just kind of thought, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And uh, I don't know if I may have ended up missing out on a few good games because of that. Here's Marvel Super Heroes. So, you know, I didn't really get into fighting games, to be honest, uh, back then, mostly because I, I primarily played games by myself and obviously fighting games are better if you're going to play two player and uh, games like this that are arcade ports are great if you're going to use this to sort of practice at home and uh, and then go into the arcade and play against other people 
which uh, I, of course, uh, did not do. That being said, this game, it looks really awesome uh, as far as the uh, sort of shell, shell shaded, cell shaded style of graphics go. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think, was this the first installment in the series that also included Marvel vs. Capcom and MVC2? I assume so. Um, this was a Capcom CPS2 game, I think, in the arcade. Uh, over here, I don't know what, uh, oh, this is an ad for uh, Oddworld, is it not? Yeah. So, uh, again, I mean, it's a cool game. I don't know why I never got into it. If, if you like uh, two-dimensional, uh, you know, side-scrolling action games, uh, Oddworld is cool. And Oddworld has really good graphics, obviously, being on a 32-bit console. One, this is another game I know absolutely nothing uh, about One. Uh, never picked it up, never rented it, never played a demo disc. Uh, looks like some kind of 3D action, like third-person action game. And then here, I don't know. Oh, yeah, this ad continues. This is just more more odd world. Uh, here's Armored Core. So I never played Armored Core uh, uh, back then. But uh, when the PS2 came out, uh, my friend and I went and got in line on launch day and got PS2s. And Armored Core 2 was the game that he picked up with his PlayStation. Street Fighter EX Plus. Uh, this is obviously a, a 3D polygonal Street Fighter game. Um, they seem to think it's awesome. That's what they say here. Street Fighter has finally gone 3D. And from what we've seen, it's awesome. I don't know. You know, to me, Street Fighter should be like a 2D game. But uh, that being said, I haven't played this game. So maybe it's really good. Uh, I feel like I've read reviews of it that uh, were positive about it. So it, for all I know, it may be a very good game. What else we got here? Batman and Robin, Pandemonium 2. Here's an ad for Steel Rain. Uh, I could swear I had Steel Rain. Um, it, I feel like games with tank controls, whether they actually featured a tank or not, were pretty popular in the early days uh, of the PlayStation. And I've definitely played this game. I don't know if I covered it in a magazine read-through or something, but I remember thinking this game was pretty cool. What else we got? Golden Nugget. Uh, I just don't understand who was buying uh, these, like, casino games. But, you know, they, I mean, casino-style games go all the way back to, like, the Atari 2600, right? But, I mean, there were a few of them on the NES. And, you know, I just, I feel like if you were my age playing any of those systems, like, you know, when I was, like, 12 years old playing the NES, I didn't want, you know, Casino Kid. And, uh, you know, certainly when I was 20 and had a PlayStation, I didn't want anything to do with Golden Nugget. Although it is kind of cool that apparently it has Adam West of Batman fame in it. So that would be kind of neat. Over here is Ghost in the Shell, which uh, I think it must have been PSM issue number three when we talked about that one more extensively. Uh, speaking of games with tank controls, uh, I remember thinking this was a pretty cool a pretty cool game. I guess Ghost in the Shell is uh, is an anime series. I don't know anything about it. But um, but I had I remember having fun recording the gameplay footage for Ghost in the Shell for that other read through. Uh, here we get into Formula One Championship Edition. Uh, you know, this is back when Psygnosis was making these Formula One games on uh, on the PlayStation. And, uh, you know, for what they are, they're cool games. I don't, I don't have any fun, to be honest, going back and playing them now just because, you know, I got a PS4 with a steering wheel controller. And so to go back and play a game like this with, you know, digital controls on a, on a gamepad um, aside from just the nostalgia of seeing like the old teams and the old liveries and the old engine noises. And, uh, I don't remember if Murray Walker, uh, did the commentary for this particular game or not, but I remember him doing it for some of these older F1 games, like that kind of stuff is cool. But other than that, there's just not a whole re lot of reason to want to go back and, uh, and play those now, uh, over here on the other hand, NHL 98, I guess spoilers for future episode of flashback, but uh, NHL 97 was the second PlayStation game uh, that I bought. And NHL 97 definitely is a bad game, but I had just a ton of fun playing it in the summer of 97. Uh, you know, I picked it up probably sometime in June. And then uh, this says that 98 came out in November. I don't know if it actually ended up coming out at that time or not. But basically, I played NHL 97 like nonstop 
between June and whenever I picked this up, which would have been right when it came out. And uh, this game is so much better than 97 was. Uh, they completely changed the game engine around. And, um, you know, I haven't extensively played every NHL game, uh, EA game, I mean, uh, on the PlayStation. But uh, I think I could make an argument to myself that 98 might have been the best installment. 98 or 2001 on the PlayStation is also... Uh, a really good game but um you know as soon as this game came out 98 i just basically switched over and just started playing the crap out of this one and uh, i just had a ton of fun uh cart world series um yeah so i don't remember buying or well i definitely didn't buy this game i don't remember ever renting this game uh, around this time ea had an indie car game that was called just andretti racing i believe and I remember renting that game with, with my friend Fabian. And, I mean, it was okay. I, I feel like I didn't really get into driving games on the PlayStation until Gran Turismo. Because I would, I would rent some, some of these other games and just think, well, you know, it's okay. But uh, not something that I'd really want to buy. But um, I think I might have even bought Gran Turismo when it was a Greatest Hits title. I might have waited until it was 20 bucks. Uh, VR Sports Football. Uh, I don't... I got nothing. What do we got here? Versus. Uh, really, the only thing I remember about Versus is seeing the ads, you know, with this chick that just has her pants down around her, around her thighs or whatever. Um, other than that, I just, I don't know anything about it. It's another THQ game, so I wasn't really into fighting games, like I said. But even if I was, I probably would have steered clear of that one. Here's Moto Racer GP, which I also don't. Don't know anything about it. It looks kind of cool. I mean, it seems like aside from just being a, a MotoGP game, like down here, you're you're like, what is this? Like you're driving on the Great Wall of China and then you're you're racing in the snow and, and then you're like dirt racing. So, I mean, that looks like kind of a cool game to check out. Oh, Mega Man X4. So uh, I had this game. I don't think I bought this game right when it came out, uh, although I, I wouldn't swear to it. You know, obviously, I have great memories of Mega Man on the NES. And uh, when I saw this game, I, actually, I think I did pay full price for this game. I think I got this game at Sears Funtronics. And this was this was also one of the very first games. I might have even had this game. Well, no, this game didn't come out until October. So I definitely had Final Fantasy VII first. But it was probably one of the first five or six games I had for the PlayStation. To be honest, like I bought it and like I just couldn't really get into it. It didn't remind me enough of uh, of like an old school Mega Man game. But I've told this story before, but I remember my friend Chris came over one night. Uh, Chris had a Nintendo 64 and I think he kind of had like buyer's remorse a little bit because uh, he would come over and play my PlayStation you know, and he would say, like, man, I wish I'd gotten a PlayStation instead of an N64. Like, I'm not trying to trash the N64 or anything, but I think for guys our age um, who were maybe into the kind of games we were into, I think that, you know, maybe the N64 was the better choice. But uh, I remember he came over and was playing this game so much, and I had the PlayStation hooked up out in, out in the living room because that was a bigger TV. Uh, I finally went to bed, and he just kept playing, so I don't know how far he got, but... Uh, it's unfortunate because I think that my, my uh, you know, I don't, underwhelming reaction maybe to Mega Man X4 caused me to kind of ignore Mega Man 8 when I think in actuality I should have gotten Mega Man 8 instead of Mega Man X4. But if you're into the X series, I mean, it's a cool game. It's got good graphics. It just, I just couldn't get into it when I got it. Here's Test Drive 4. Uh, the Test Drive series of games are really cool, but once again... I didn't really get into driving games on the PlayStation until I started playing Gran Turismo. So any of the test drive games that I had, I would say that I probably picked up once I started like collecting what were by then, quote unquote, old PlayStation games. Hardwood Heroes. I'd never actually heard of Hardwood Heroes. Uh, it's a Midway game. So I don't know. Was this mid? I think this was like Midway's attempt at... Uh, making a basketball game that was not arcade yet. It says here, Hardwood Heroes is a five-on-five -five basketball simulation that features all the real players, uh, except the usual MIAs. 
uh, and uniforms. The graphics aren't mind blowing, but they're easily as good as most other basketball games. So, like you know, Midway is more well known for like NBA Jam and whatnot. So, I guess this was their attempt at trying to compete with things like uh, NBA Live. Here's the video game glove. Uh, I don't, I don't know anything about that. I don't understand why you would use that. I mean, I, I guess I'd have maybe if someone's done like a YouTube review of it or something, I could kind of see like what you would use that for. Oh, here's game day 98. So this, I think, is the only football game I ever had for the PlayStation. I believe it was game day 98. Uh, I think I asked for it for Christmas in 1997 and uh, and got it. And uh, couldn't really get that into it because I, I was just really terrible uh, at it. Like at that point, the only football game I'd ever played and really enjoyed was the first Tecmo Bowl but, you know, you would see ads like this or uh, at some point they reviewed Game Day 98 in PSM. I don't know if it was an issue number one or if we just haven't seen it yet. Um, or if it was an issue number three or something. I'm pretty sure we actually saw the review of it on the show. But um, I, I got it based on that because, you know, I was a really big football fan at the time. Uh, well, and I still am now. And so I wanted to have like a modern football game, but then like I tried playing this and I just, you know, it was like too many buttons or I just didn't want to learn. Like I don't have like a good excuse. I was just like too impatient with it, I guess. Uh, here's a preview for Test Drive 4. Uh, certainly looks like a cool game. And then uh, here's uh, here's the, the subscription cards. I must have pulled out like one of the loose ones here. But uh, yeah, Charter Offer, it was only a dollar an issue. Like how could you say no to a whole year subscription to PlayStation Magazine or PSM Magazine for uh, for only 12 bucks? Uh, kind of interestingly, uh, this is not the cover of an actual issue. This was just some kind of mock-up. But I, I want to say like I think I subscribed to this magazine for three years. Uh, I was still subscribing. I was still subscribing. I think when the PS2 came out, but I think what ended up happening is I like moved away to go to college, and I got more into PC gaming. And because uh, I think after I moved away, like when I would come home, my mom would give me my mail, and it would include some PSM uh, issues. The Bug Riders, I don't know anything about, but uh, Bravo Air Race. Okay, I guess Bravo Air Race would be an example. That's a THQ game, but uh, I think this is actually a really cool game. I played this game on a demo disc that I got at some point around this time, and I thought it was really cool. Uh, it was one of those demos I played like over and over and over again, but uh, I never picked up the game until sometime probably within the last 10 years. And at least for me, it's still as good as I remember it being, but maybe it's not for everybody. Uh, you know, it's a racing game, but you know, you're in like one of these stunt planes and you're like flying through canyons or, or flying between buildings. Um, I don't know. I just think it's a pretty fun game. Here's Gex, an ad for Gex, Enter the Gecko. Uh, you know, I, the first Gex, I think, was a pretty good game when it was 2D. I don't know how well it translated to 3D. And then here's, this is part one of uh, this Accessorize Your PlayStation uh, uh, article. So, you know, over here, here are just like various game controllers that you could get. Uh, for your PlayStation, but like these are all supposed to just sort of be direct replacements, I think, for the standard controller. And I used to just never understand stuff like this. Like, why would you buy one of these controllers instead of the standard controller? Because here they're showing standard controller suggested retail price nineteen ninety nine. Now the PlayStation came with two controllers, so uh, I mean, unless you were going to play a four player game. You know, using the multi tap or whatever the whatever the PlayStation version of the multi tap was called. Uh, you know, I don't know why you would pick up another controller unless you broke one of yours. But um, what I'm saying is, why would you bother buying one of these other controllers just to save literally a few dollars? Uh, here's the Mad Cats controller, twelve ninety nine. Here's an ASCII control pad, which doesn't really look that great, and it's the exact same price as the first party controller. This Alps game pad is $40. Uh, the only thing I'd be interested in with that, if that's the same Alps that makes Alps key switches, that might make it interesting to check out. Like if it has micro switches inside of it or something, then maybe that would be cool. Uh, I don't know. And then over here, they have this thing called the play stick. So this was like this rubber nubbin that you could put over the uh, uh, D-pad on your controller. That looks kind of neat. And it was only seven bucks. So you didn't, you weren't really risking that much. 
But um, and they thought highly of it. They gave it uh, they gave it a perfect five out of five and said it was uh, top honors. Um, other than that, well, so here's this Nyko controller. At least that has like a normal D pad, uh, as does this the Rock controller, which is ten bucks but gets one star out of five. Over here we have enhanced controllers. So like these were controllers. Like you, if you bought this, you, it was bringing something new to the table. Like you know, I don't know, maybe like turbo or things like that. Um, I don't really have anything to say about maybe any of these. I'm just trying to see if anything kind of stands out here is looking cool. Oh well, here's the here's the ASCII grip. Uh, I talked about that on uh, an episode of CGQ Plus a while back because I picked it up at a video game store. This is a one-handed controller. They give it a five out of five. What do they say here? Uh, description: A one-handed controller marketed for RPGs that fits into your palm. It has a number or it has a rubber grip on the bottom to keep it from flying out of your hand. The X and circle buttons are located on the bottom for easy access with the index finger. You can reposition any of the buttons to your own preferences. What we thought of it. In the last issue, we gave it five stars. The innovative grip leaves one hand free to do other things like take notes, eat, drink, pet the dog, or whatever without missing a beat uh, of your game. The D-pad works just as it should, and you can use it in your left or right hand. Get this pad if you're an RPG fan or if you just want to get other stuff done while you're playing games. See, I don't... I was never playing like Final Fantasy VII or something and just thinking, man, it would be great if I had one of my hands free to like flick through the guide or something like that. I could more see uh, a controller like that being useful as an accessibility thing for somebody who has like a disability or, you know, is missing a digit or missing a hand or something. I picked it up just sort of purely out of nostalgia from seeing it in these magazines and out of curiosity but I can't really ever see wanting to like use it instead of a standard controller. Here they have wireless controllers. Uh, here we get into analog controllers. I remember seeing this, this ASCII sphere at the store. I don't really understand what it would be used for. It says the ASCII sphere will feature a 360 degree axis analog ball. It will also have a normal D-pad with all the normal action buttons. The sphere is based on a similar pad called the Space Orb for the PC, which is a controller of choice for the Quake World Champion. So I, I don't know, maybe it's cool, I guess. I just, I'm having a hard time figuring out what I would use that for. Uh, over here is this Barracuda controller, which kind of in some ways looks more like an Xbox 360 controller or something. Uh, I don't know, I mean, it looks okay, but it's 30 bucks, which is about the same price or maybe exactly the same price as the first party. Oh, it's right here. Yeah, they don't have the retail price for Sony's analog controller yet. But uh, the main one I wanted to point out here, uh, right here is the Nejicon controller. Uh, I have one of those. I've had one of those for a long time. The Nejicon controller sort of like uh, twists in the middle. In fact, the, the name Nejicon comes from the Japanese word uh, Nejiru, which means to twist. So that's why it's called the Nejicon. And uh, so that's like your analog x-axis input is the twisting, uh, you know, and they primarily marketed it for like Ridge Racer, but uh, it also worked with the Air Combat and Ace, like Air Combat and then Ace Combat 2, Ace Combat 3, and it works pretty well for that, but at least in my opinion, and they don't mention it here, the number one best use of the Nejicon is for the Wipeout games. And uh, over here they get into joysticks. And the only one I wanted to point out, uh, they vary like 30 bucks, 40 bucks. Wow, 55 bucks for the specialized ASCII stick. Uh, 50 bucks for this Interact one. But the one they have here, the Namco joystick, I don't know if this is actually how much it was. The Namco joystick, it says suggested retail price, $29.99. I have one of those joysticks. Like it's all metal and it uses what at least feel like real Japanese arcade controls, like Sanwa buttons and a Sanwa stick. That is a very, very, very high quality joystick. I would I would say that in my opinion, that's probably the best joystick for the PlayStation. And so I was just surprised to see that it was only $30, uh, unless that's some kind of typo or error. So that's the end of the uh, accessories article. At some point, we're gonna start getting into like guides. And yeah, we're here. 
which I'm not going to really have a whole lot to say about. So even though there's still quite a bit of this magazine left in a way, we're kind of getting towards the end of what I'm going to have to talk about. Uh, Clock Tower walkthrough. Again, I've never played Clock Tower. Oh, here's an ad for Rampage World Tour. Uh, this is a cool game. If you like Rampage, if you grew up like me playing Rampage uh, in the arcade or playing one of the home ports of it, uh, Rampage World Tour was a subsequent arcade release that ended up getting ported to both the PlayStation and the Saturn. And uh, if you like Rampage, there's nothing not to like, in my opinion, about Rampage World Tour. We've talked about these before, these bonus tip sleeves. So these were meant, like these are perforated, and uh, they're meant to be, you know, carefully uh, torn out of here. And they're the right size so that you could just tuck it into your game, like put it behind the manual or something. Uh, I, of course, never did that because I saved my magazines anyway. Oh, they show you here how to do it. Uh, I saved all my magazines anyway, so I had no reason to tear it out. But here they've got uh, little uh, mini guides, if you want to call it that, for Castlevania Symphony of the Night and Bushido Blade. And uh, what do they got here? Well, they got the Merchant's List and Spell List, Relic List. Yeah, that's it. And then, you know, as you might expect for Bushido Blade, it's all character moves. Over here uh, is Prap of the Rapper again. Again, I just don't really understand why I never picked that game up. Uh, oh, skip the page here. Here's a walkthrough for Symphony of the Night, which would be pretty helpful, I would say, because it's got uh, these maps. So uh, I, I didn't have that. I don't remember. I don't remember if I had to use a guide when I played Castlevania or not, honestly. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember having one, and it was certainly before... I um, had any, I didn't have like a laptop computer or something like sitting next to me on the couch. So I don't know how I would have used a guide, but so something like this might have been helpful. Uh, items list for Castlevania. Uh, MLB 99. Uh, this is another uh, first party Sony game. Uh, I, I had one baseball game for the PlayStation and it was called MLB Pennant Race and I forgot who made it. But uh, I remember having a lot of fun with that game. I think that game still used sprites, so if I remember correctly. So the graphics were a lot smoother. You can see here that this is polygon-based, and so it looks kind of rough. And then here is part two of the Final Fantasy VII uh, strategy guide. Here you can see a screenshot of the snowboarding uh, area or whatever. That, uh, that was pretty fun. I remember having a lot of fun with that. It's just such a good game. It, it pains me when I see people talking about how they don't think this is a good game or, you know, just because for me, there's so much nostalgia wrapped up in Final Fantasy VII that I can't really be objective when when talking about it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, at some point, you know, I mentioned before, I ended up getting a guide, like an actual guide for Final Fantasy VII. But for sure, I bought this uh, issue and was still using this guide. And uh, and got the 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 dedicated guide uh, later on. Ten bucks off Game Day ninety eight. It was pretty common for Sears Funtronics to put these ten dollar off coupons in uh, in these magazines. Which I mean, that's a pretty big discount. You're getting a twenty percent discount on a game, so that's nothing to sneeze at. Bushido Blade, Bushido Blade guide. Then here's a bunch of codes. Anything cool in here? Um. No, what's Pitball? I don't even know what that is. Well, here's some codes for Porsche Challenge. That's kind of cool. Unlimited tries, test driver available. Why would you want fisheye lens? That's kind of neat, I guess, though. Um, Triple Play 98, Twisted Metal 2. Homing Napalm Advanced Attack. That would be cool. Uh, here's the letters to the editor. I used to always read all the letters to the editor when I would read these. Um, I don't know how much, they're probably not that interesting now, but, and then I, I've, I mentioned this before in one of the other, uh, read throughs, but I'll just point it out again. They had this link up section, which I just think now is just, you would never do this now, but you know, want to hook up with other gamers from around the world. Just drop us a postcard with your name, address, favorite genre, your current favorite games and your age, and they'll print it. And so here's all these people, like, here's this guy's name, email address and home address. Like, it, it just speaks to how different the times were in the 90s that you could do that and not even think twice about it. 
because, you know, obviously we would never do that. We would never do that now. Uh, it's more. What's that? Oh, yes. People complaining that the American analog pad doesn't have the vibration feedback, which is very understandable because uh, the feedback really having the vibration feedback really is cool. Uh, and then here is Ask, Ask Sony. So uh, I don't know how exactly that worked because this is an independent PlayStation magazine. That was something that they were really proud of. And so I don't know um, if they were forwarding these to Sony and then getting a response. I'm not really sure. Oh, the link cable. Uh, oh, Time Crisis is going to be a one or two player game. If Time Crisis is going to be a two player game, will I be able to buy another gun con? Good question, because if you bought Time Crisis, I guess it came with the gun con. Uh, and then here they would have these challenges that they would put out. Uh, I don't remember what you would win. Like challenge one, get a perfect on Dracula and Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Uh, challenge number three, Bushido Blade, are you a true samurai? What does it say here? This month we're giving away a limited edition blood red bat shaped uh, Alps control pad. Only 5,000 exist. On top of that, the ones we're giving away are from the first batch of 500 and they're autographed by Sony and Alps. So I don't know. Does that mean they're giving away 500 of them? I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess that would be cool. I never tried to like send anything into any of these magazines. Uh, and then here's marketplace. So it's kind of the same thing as the hookup section. Uh, you could sell things in uh, in here. You 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 know same thing. Perry Mercer, and then there's his email address and his home address, and you know he's got the following the following games for sale. So I mean it's kind of like a news group or something. So I I just can't imagine like you know how many issues of this magazine were getting printed out. I would just think that you'd be trying to sell a game in here and you'd end up getting like a hundred people trying to buy it if it was a good deal. Uh, next month in the uh, next month's issue, sorry, my mouth is getting dry. Uh, obviously, we already did, did a read through of this magazine, but they talk about uh, Resident Evil Two coverage, accessorizing your PlayStation Part Two, uh, PlayStation Party games. You remember that uh, that article? And then here they're showing Parappa uh, again. And then at the end here, we've got an ad for Maximum Force, which I've never played, and Mace: The Dark Age, which I've also never played. And then what is on the back cover? Formula One Championship Edition, which that's kind of cool, actually. That's actually pretty cool, only because, like, you know, Formula One racing is not popular here in the States. So for that to be in the back cover is uh, is pretty neat. So anyway, uh, there is my original copy of PSM issue number two from October of 1997.